Hey everyone, it's Kirsten. Welcome to Season 3 of The Anthropocene. The scene is set. You rise before the sun, throw on a shirt and a pair of shorts, grab your bag that hangs by the door, and head down the hill to the water. The sunrise could be described as no other than breathtaking, but you don't have time to enjoy it. There's work to be done. You jog to catch up as you already see your team pushing the boat from the sand into the water. You start pushing, one last shove, and you hop into the boat. The sea spray is cold and salty as it hits you right in the face. The boat is turned around and races out to the sea. You bounce up and down in the water, and the motor practically drowns out your thoughts. You sigh quietly, hoping that the sea is more generous today. Hello, my beautiful nerds. It's Kirsten here. I'm super excited because um, a little bit of a different intro today from a bit of a different perspective um, than we usually have because we have a super cool topic uh, that we are going to explore with my esteemed guest and conservation ecologist, Maria Dabrowski. Hello, Maria. Thank you for coming. How I are you? So glad to be here. I'm great. I'm very excited to chat about this and I'm just very grateful to be here. Awesome. I'm so happy. We'll get you to introduce yourself in a sec, but um, just for the audience. So today we are diving and get it diving <laughs> into <laughs> a really cool topic um, that I think is so, so important. We are talking about um, conservation, of course, but we're going to highlight a bit of a focus on the artisanal, oh, on the artisanal fishermen in Ecuador. Uh, so there's fish, men, fishermen, sea turtles, conservation, quality of life, social justice, sharks, and so much to unpack here. Um, so let's just get into it. <laughs> uh, Maria, before we really do get into it, can you just introduce yourself for everyone? Who are you? What do you do? Sure. Oh, boy. That's a question. Who am I? <laughs> um, all right. I I am a person who has a lot of interests. Yeah. I'm currently and have been over the last four or five years looking for ways to marry those interests. And so those interests are psychology, behavioral science, why we do what we do, what influences what we do. Um, and then all of that within the realm of conservation, of protecting the planet. Um, but very specifically, my like deepest passion lies within the ocean. And so what I do right now for work is I work for the organization called Rare. Um, I do community outreach for Rare. Rare does do that great job of behavioral science and how we can use it for conservation. Um, and I really became enamored with Rare's um, sort of goals because I was doing exactly that in my master's work, which was fishermen, and I say men because all the people in our study were men, uh, but fishermen yeah. and uh, ocean conservation and behavioral science, what are the fishermen's perspectives on ocean conservation? So besides that, I love birds and cats and reading and everything fascinates me. Someone told me that the other day that they don't know anybody as fascinated as me by anything and everything. So um that is that is a little bit about who I am. All right. That's so cool. I mean, I think, you know, being fascinated by the little things in life is, yeah. is what keeps me going most of the time, too. So um, better to be more than not. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> that's so great. Yeah. Um, I love I mean, we're going to dive into it more, but I love this. Like, you're talking about like find a way that we can connect people and our behavior and, you know, socioeconomics and everything, you know, into conservation, because it is not just a black and white box that we can um, deal with. So, I mean, as you kind of mentioned already, we're going to be talking a bit about your master's project. Um, I just skimmed through because I didn't want any spoilers, uh, but I just kind of got a feel for what it was. So can you just tell us a little bit more about what the project was and, and what yeah. you what you were, were out? Sorry. And what you were after? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so my grandma's Ecuadorian and I've always felt a great sense of pride of, of being Ecuadorian myself. Um, and as I mentioned, I've always loved the ocean and specifically what I love within the ocean are sea turtles. I have my water bottle that's covered in sea turtle stickers and people are always like, nice. so do you like turtles? And I'll be like, yes, <laughs> yes I do. Just, just a little. Like slightly. Yeah. Um, 
And so I knew that when I got to the University of Michigan, the School for Environment and Sustainability, that I wanted to do a master's that really focused on people. People, because a lot of times we villainize people um, as being part of the problem without realizing that they too are part of the solution. And so I knew I wanted to do something in Ecuador. Um, I knew I wanted to do something with sea turtles and where I landed was meeting a really wonderful person called Callie Vielenturf, who um, is the founder and, and runs the nonprofit, The Leatherback Project. And so Callie had a lot of um, a lot of already formed relationships and trust with artisanal fishers all along the coast of Ecuador. And we got to thinking that there are so many sort of um, conservation goals that Ecuador has, you know, they have the Galapagos Islands, they have, they're just a country with so many resources um, that Ecuador, the Ecuadorian government will often come up with these policies and regulations and laws to protect the ocean. But very infrequently is, are those laws made with and including the perspectives of artisanal fishermen, right? So there are these laws that greatly influence the fishers in Ecuador mm -hmm. without their input. And that just seems a little bit, a little bit, a little bit backwards. And so right. what we wanted to do, right, is, is learn because so much of science and, and conservation is um, the fishers are killing the turtles and the sharks. We need to teach them. And that kind of parachute science -y, we know what's right, they don't know what's right, we're going to come in here and try and disrupt culture and tradition and community. It's, I don't, that's never, I've never quite understood that as a, as a logic for um, research. And so mm -hmm. what we did was we worked with the fishermen and the primary purpose of, or primary method was to listen to their stories. And so um, we worked with local Ecuadorian coastal university students, um, and we had a survey, um, sort of an open-ended interview type situation. Um, and there are five coastal provinces in Ecuador, and we were able to survey fully three of the five. So it, it's definitely still a work in progress, as all mm -hmm. research really is. Um, but we were able to survey three of the five provinces and had incredible conversations with over a hundred fishermen. I believe in the end it was 120 um, wow. about their perspectives and their values as they relate to ocean conservation, um, specifically in Ecuador as artisanal fishermen. Right. That's so, so interesting and so cool. And I think it's, it's really important and, and thankfully, you know, as you know, I try to be a bit of an optimist, you're seeing a lot more of this science that's moving away from kind of this, you call it like whatever colonial or umbrella science where it's just like, okay, we're just going to like throw this over top of what works. And I mean, in government too, there's so much government policy that is like not properly backed by even by science <laughs> and then let alone including the, <laughs> including the people involved. Right. So, so getting, you know, this information is is so good and and working on unvilifying as well is, is so important because i think this is something that i've definitely been guilty of um in the past and probably still am something that i'm personally working on all the time is stop being like oh like you know humans are the bad guys and we're destroying the planet and mm -hmm. and it's it's hard to not sometimes because you see all this filth and garbage and, yeah. and problems and but you know moving away from that is, is so cool so um, we'll see a little bit about um, how you guys worked on that. Um, so why then is it important to include people like fishermen in, in conservation plans? Because, yeah, we said, okay, they're, they're part of it. But mm -hmm. why deeper than that is it important? So if we want any kind of conservation measure to work, right, mm -hmm. The people who are involved in not only supporting that conservation measure, but actively not breaking that conservation measure have to be on board with it, right? And there's a variety right. of reasons why someone might not be on board with it. It could be mm -hmm. financial. It could be that it goes against their values. It could be that they would be on board with it under certain circumstances, but as it stands right now, they can't support it. And so there's this variety of barriers and motivations to actually conforming with and supporting laws that will ultimately help both people and nature. And so 
um, when it comes to these, when it comes to fishing, and it's such a complex problem because you have the artisanal fishers, which to define are small scale fishers who often work on smaller boats, um, often have smaller catches. Um, historically, artisanal fishers would, you know, sell fish locally or support their families with with fish and with um, resources from the ocean. And then you have the larger scale industrial commercial commercial fishers who have the big boats and who are putting out so many nets and who are catching so many, not only their target fish, but anything else, which is bycatch, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of laws that are sometimes being made to stop the bad things about commercial industrial fishing that also will impact er, artisanal fishers even though they're working in completely different worlds. And that's not to right. say that artisanal fishers aren't also potentially contributing to certain problems like bycatch. There is um, a lot of studies out there that show that artisanal, artisanal fishers are definitely contributing to bycatch. Mm-hmm. But the whole point is that you want to make sure that the people who um, can have a really great impact on ocean conservation are on board with the proposed rules and regulations of a country and that those rules and regulations are co-created by both the government who also have interesting perspectives on how things should be done and the communities that will be most directly impacted. Did I answer your question? Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. That was perfect. Exactly. Yeah. Like it starts, it starts and ends on the ground and, okay. and with the local people that are there. Exactly. exactly. So, you know, if you're going to come in and say, okay, here are the, here are the rules, you can decide whether you want to be involved in that or not. But as a exactly. community, like getting to have a say in that, um, you know, and, and coming from with outside perspectives, I don't think is ever necessarily a bad thing either. No. You know, these universities are coming from the States because yeah, we've, we've done the research and we figured it out. So how do we then, you know, put those pieces together of like what we've figured out and what we think works and, and make it work with, I mean, what people have seen for generations and and what they've worked on. Um, So kind of along that line, uh, something that I'd love to know about is how, I mean, you said you got some of these awesome stories, but how was it interacting with the local people? Like, were they super happy to chat? Were they pretty cooperative? Um, I mean, I'm sure you had a bit of everything, but what was the general story? You know, also sorry for disappearing. I had to let the cat out before. That's Paul fine. Paul has a very operatic meow and it would have been on stop. I, <laughs> I can imagine. Um, when we first began, we were told no one's going to talk to you. Right. No one's going to talk to you about bycatch. No one's going to admit that they're catching, potentially eating, potentially selling endangered species so that they can get in trouble. Mm-hmm. No one's going to yeah. want to talk to you because they might think that you're with the government. They might think <laughs> that you're going to come after them. Right. Yeah. And so there were certain steps that we took that had dual purpose. Um, so one of them was working closely with university students. University students, A, while I'm Ecuadorian, my skin is very, very, very pale. I do not mm-hmm. look like I am a coastal Ecuadorian because I'm not, I come from the mountains um, where where you have more, more pale folks. Um, and so one of the things that we did was working with those students who are from the coast. They understand uh-huh. not only the the language, but the, the customs and the slang, which is a big thing. Um, yeah. And so not only were these students who were amazing, uh, you know, able to help out with the research and, and their undergraduate students. So, you know, good exposure, but also we paid them because I don't believe in um, experience without pay when whenever yeah. possible. Um, but also their presence was a lot less threatening than if I had come in and said, I'm working, we're going to, you know, influence the government. And it wasn't, it wasn't a lot. We, we, of course, ethics, we told um, every single fisherman what the point of the project was. Um, but it's, it's when you go in and even if you have trust with the community, if you bring in new people, it's, there's still going to be an obstacle. And so working with the students, um, we had, let's see, about five or six or maybe even seven students who helped out, um, they were able to have these really deep conversations. And so, like you said, there are some fishers who answer the questions. It was a 20 minute interview done. Um, And then Mm -hmm. there were people who we have one hour plus long recordings of people who 
particularly um, people who had been fishing for a long time who said, let me tell you how things have changed over the years. Let me tell you how we don't see fish anymore. Let me tell you how all of these rules are being created by the government that look really good internationally, but they're not backed up by um, people actually patrolling to make sure that they're, that they're enforced. Mm-hmm. All of these things. And so um, the conversations that we had, contrary to what everyone told us, were incredibly deep. We had no um, rough experiences with any fishers. Lots of vulnerability, um, lots of emotions. Um, Mm -hmm. And I I think that's a testament to my team that they were able to create an interview setting, which were all public. I mean, we did them on the beaches and local restaurants in hammocks, like wherever wherever we found fishers who would talk to us. Right. Um, they made it such a welcoming space that people were able to tell their story and able to shed tears and able to share their concerns. Um, even tell us about some of the really horrific things that they've experienced on the, uh, on the ocean, because um, the issue of pirates has become massive and incredibly dangerous. And so the experience of, and, and so the students who we were working with did an amazing job of doing the majority of the surveys. When I was able to get to Ecuador, thankfully after COVID, it took a lot of planning. Um, Mm -hmm. I also was able to do a few interviews um, and again, had just incredible experiences um, with the fishermen. This may come up later, but I'm going to bring it up now too, that one of the other things that we did in this study, besides just interviewing um, was you know, when you put together a report that's ultimately going to be delivered to a government, those reports are really bland. But more importantly, Mm -hmm. they are reports that tend to lump people together as a group, artisanal fishers, and we don't want that to happen. We want anybody who's reading this report to know that we're talking about humans and individuals. And so one of the ways that we did that was by photographing the fishers um, with their permission, of course. Um, Mm -hmm. Photographing the faces of the fishers so that they can transform from a, a nameless, faceless group, as they're often talked about, to people with faces. Uh, we did not share their names for, for many reasons. Um, mm-hmm. But we also photographed their hands because this is a, a very manual job. And, uh, you know, if you've ever looked at a, a fisher's hands, someone who does it for a living, they are covered with scars and each of those scars tell stories. And so in this report, which was also part of the the chatting with fishermen, right? To ask, to go up to somebody and say, may I take your photo? They're like, who are Mm -hmm. you? What do you want? And why do you want my photo, right? (laughs) But if you had enough, and there there were certainly people who said, no, thank you. But we had a lot Mm -hmm. of of people who were like, okay, yeah, you can. Um, Or if they didn't want their face photographed, they were fine with their their hands being photographed. And so I think that that Mm -hmm. is just another testament to the team of the kind of, um, the kind of, very open, trustworthy interviews that we were able to have with the fishermen and learned an incredible amount. Right. That's so cool. Yeah. I think a lot of the times people are more willing to, to collaborate than, than we initially think, but that approach was so important um, from you guys, from your team to, yeah, include local, especially students. Like people are way happier to help somebody that's like, you know, working towards their undergrad thesis or something. Exactly. Um, yeah, so that's that's really amazing. And I think that the photography part, that is something that I skimmed through. Um, and I think that's like a really cool element to, yeah, just try to bring, you know, like a person because it's just numbers on the sheet all the time, you know, on, mm-hmm. on all these different reports. And it's it's fishermen one through 120, you know, right. instead of people with families and needs and wants yep. and fears and dreams and, you know, lives. So exactly. that's that's really, really cool. That's awesome. Um, so for this project, there was a couple different things that you were trying to figure out for objectives. And one of them was just kind of how fishermen viewed conservation in, in general, mm-hmm. um, if I'm not, if I'm correct. And what did you kind of find there? We had a mixture of responses. So a mm-hmm. lot of people defined conservation kind of exactly how you would maybe think that conservation would be defined, which is to protect the animals. Um, Other people took it a bit further and talked about it in in that exact sense, but also what it meant to them personally or culturally or traditionally. And so, um, you know, people would say it's important. 
a lot of people would say it's important for food. It's important for money. Um, we had quite a few people say conservation is important because I want my grandchildren and great grandchildren to see the fish that I know my great grandpa saw. Um, and right. one of the cool things about fishing generally across the world is that it is a a trade that is passed from one generation to another, right? So there were quite a few um, villages, towns that we went to where you would say, one of the you know first questions we asked, are you a fisherman? And I said, of course, this is a fishing town. What do you what do you think we do here? You know, where everybody <laughs> that they know is is fishing, and that's changing right. these days as younger generations go to cities. But you know, it's a very it's a it's a thing that a lot of people are very proud about. So they would define conservation as um, protecting animals, but also protecting animals for a particular reason beyond just protecting the animals. Um, right. And for them, conservation, you know, there was varying levels of familiarity with different conservation tools that the government's using, like marine protected areas. What is a marine protected area, which it's just it's what it sounds like, right? An area that's protected and, and only certain activities are able to be done there versus a uh -huh. no take zone, which is where nothing can be taken. Um, uh -huh or different um, technologies that are used for, for, so for example, with sea turtles, a way to help reduce sea turtle bycatch is to include on the ends of some nets, a, a turtle excluder device or a TED. It just allows the sea turtle to swim out of the net, but keeps the fish in the net. Um, and so there was varying amount of knowledge with that. The Leatherback Project is doing really cool work with LED lights on fishing nets that don't impact fish catch quantity, but do scare away um, often by caught animals, uh, birds, oh, good. sharks, turtles, mm -hmm. dolphins, etc. Um, and so, you know, conservation, some of them were really, some of the fishers had a lot of knowledge about conservation and, and the different ways that conservation can happen. Um, and others were... Uh, just starting to to understand more fully. So really cool. we got a variety yeah. of answers. Yeah, that's that's really cool though. Like I think for me I'm pleasantly surprised to hear that you had like such an overwhelming positive response of, you know, people are saying, yeah, like we, we know that we have to, you know, take care of the fish um, or we're not going to have any more and mm -hmm. this really speaks to you know, the difference that you see in, in small scale, like fishing versus like industrial fishing and, and where the, the problem actually lies versus yes. where some of the, the blame ends up kind of being put. Yes. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's this generational, cultural, beautiful thing. Well, and, and to something that you said reminded me that um, another interesting sort of breakdown of the analysis that we've done so far on the responses were, and, and I haven't fully analyzed this, though I have a suspicion. So there's uh, sort of three different fields where um, conservation depends on me or conservation depends on my community or conservation depends on the government. And so there was okay. a breakdown. I wonder, my, my suspicion is maybe there's some generational differences amongst those, those views. I think perhaps mm -hmm. the younger generations realize that they can have an impact, um, whereas some older generations think that it's the government's fault or that the government should be doing more. And so... Conservation, too, is not just what needs to be conserved and, and uh, for what reason, but who is in charge of the conservation. And it was really cool to see that we had um, a decent number of, of fishers talk about individual measures and community measures um, mm -hmm. instead of just saying, oh, it's out of our hands. It's something only the government has the power and authority to do, which was which is not true. Um, but mm -hmm. it's cool that people were realizing that to protect their community and their livelihood and in turn the ocean that they could have a role. And we saw lots of people active in that. Right. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Finding the mix, because I mean, I think we, most of us do know that like the, the major part has to lie in like pressuring the government to do the right thing. But if, if on a community and individual level, nobody's like bothered to do it unless they're going to get ca caught. Right? right. Then, then why, why, why should I care? <laughs> exactly. 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 Okay. Well, let's dive in a little bit then to um, some of kind of the other pieces. You were looking at kind of the relationship and perspective with like different marine animals and bycatch, like we're mentioning a lot, um, turtles. Mm -hmm. uh, which animals did you focus on? Because it's not just turtles. And why did you choose choose those ones? Yes, my advisor said, no, Maria, you cannot just focus on sea turtles. And I said, <laughs> fine. 
I guess. Um, so we had it broken down into a few different groups. So we had um, sea turtles, of course, sharks and rays. Um, sea turtles, more charismatic megafauna. And by that, I mean bigger animals that are very cute and lovable. Mm-hmm. Sharks and rays, I love them. I understand that not everyone loves them. Yeah. Um, dolphins, another example of the charismatic charismatic megafauna, right? Everyone loves dolphins. And then seabirds, which are these omnipresent but not always super beloved animals. So kind of a mixture. Right. And the way that we um, understood their sort of perspective or sentiment towards those animals um, was asking if they felt strongly positive about their interactions or when they see that kind of animal, moderately positive, indifferent, moderately negative, or strongly negative. Um, And Mm -hmm. we kind of looked at those responses. All the animals had moderately positive to strongly positive as their um, sort of maximum response or average response. Mm -hmm. Everyone loves sea turtles. Sharks and rays, surprisingly, was moderately positive, too, which I thought was kind of cool. Cool. Seabirds people. Okay. Seabirds people are moderately positive, but with a lot of stories of anger towards them for stealing fish. Um, Right. And uh, dolphins, um, also moderately positive. And so what was cool, too, was not just the data, but listening to the people speak about it. So luckily, I think every single person allowed us to record the audio um, because keeping it anonymous. Um, Mm -hmm. But what was fantastic was listen. So, you know, when I'm listening to these audios, not only listening to people give their, you know, views about these certain animals, but the number of, um, so in Spanish, for example, and I know, you know, this Kirsten, but animal is the word for animal. And if you say animalito, it's the diminutive, it's, it's a cute little animal. Like you use that in, in an endearing way. And so the number of fishermen who are like, Oh, I love the animalitos. I was like, oh, okay. Because when you hear that, right. you're already yeah. beyond, you know, and in English, we don't have that, but beyond just them saying that, if they're going to use the word animalito, you know that there's a different kind of relationship there, which I thought was mm-hmm. really cool and something cool about just Spanish in general. So um, overall, people had very positive um, sentiments. Not everyone did. Some people do not like sea turtles. Mm -hmm. And what we learned, too, is that while um, people do tend to have positive views about these animals, the positive view doesn't always translate into positive treatment. And so as an example, right, right, you have, um, and I don't want to get particularly graphic, so I won't go into details, but you have a a sea turtle get stuck in your net. Mm -hmm. Your options are to release the sea turtle, which will take time, and time is money. Mm -hmm. It will take cutting the sea turtle out of the net, which will likely damage the net if the sea turtle hasn't already damaged the net trying to get out, Mm -hmm. um, which is more money, right? It'll take gas because you're just, you know, you're, you're, you're not using your gas efficiently if you're sitting in the middle of the ocean trying to get the sea turtle out. So your options are to release the turtle or to kill the turtle and Mm -hmm. throw it away. And that will be a much faster process. And so what happens is even though you have these people who are like, yeah, I like sea turtles. If you might ask them, have you ever, you know, killed one or, or had that experience? They might be like, yeah, I have, because I'm a fisherman and I need to bring food home for my family. And so this kind of goes back to what you were talking about, the vilification of people generally, when you don't understand the barriers and motivations of why a person might kill a sea turtle, even though they like sea turtles Mm -hmm. and that, that, barrier to not doing it is I don't have food if I don't catch food and my family needs food you Mm -hmm. get a little bit more of an understanding okay what is the context that we need to focus on changing instead of penalizing perhaps what is another solution and so um I thought that that was super interesting about the animals in general and it it led to some very interesting discussions also some fishers uh told us that they're part of um uh, like conservation initiatives. So they'll go out and count sharks on boats and like stuff like that, which was really cool too. Okay, cool. Some like little citizen science projects and stuff. for. That's great. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's, it's the conflict, right. And, and I mean, we've talked about this on the podcast before and we've reiterated, I mean, the, the, the expression that like social justice is environmental justice, because, you know, if, if people don't have their needs met, 
then you, then you can't bother for anything else. And something that might seem as simple as, you know, oh, just cut the net and get a new one like that net is going to be, you know, like worth at least the amount that they made that entire oh, yeah. day or more. So it, it, it's a big struggle. So yeah, finding the ways that we can get access um, to the tools like the TED for, for the mm -hmm. turtle escapes and those kind of things for people and getting it to them maybe at discounted prices or exactly. for free if it's possible. Um, and yeah, exactly. Because just because you think something's really cute and cuddly and awesome, like doesn't mean, you know, you're gonna um, not kill it. I mean, growing up in the Yukon, like my family sure would would love like bears and wolves and stuff. But if mm -hmm. one is, is hanging around the property mm -hmm. too much and getting too close and cuddly and your kids are outside, like you're right. not going to think twice about that bear exactly. either. So yeah, so that's really cool. And and it's great to see though, that, you know, there is at least that appreciation there from a lot of them. So there's the room to work, I exactly. think is, is what's important. Exactly. And you might have someone who loves sea turtles, but hates sharks, but they might be interested in the role that sea turtles play in an ecosystem. And then that's right. kind of the foot in the door phenomenon, right? You start talking about sea turtles and their role. And then you say, by the way, here's an, uh, an interesting thing about sharks and the roles that they play in an ecosystem. And so we did have some of those conversations where some of the fishermen uh, knew quite a bit about uh, ecology in general. And then when you would say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, another fact, they'd be like, I did not know that. That is so cool. You know? And so it's, it's, that um, continuation of knowledge and understanding, which was really neat too, that we saw. Right, that's so cool, yeah. Um, also, uh, the laws and regulations, which I think is probably the trickier part that probably would get people a lot more worked up than <laughs> about the animals. Uh, so you guys also talked about that. Uh, what, what were some of the findings you found from how fishermen feel about how the, the government is handling things? <laughs> which I say with <laughs> a little bit of sass, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, right. Mm -hmm. I think um, there's general uh, anger for a variety of reasons. So one, um, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, there's been a lot of focus on industrial fishers and what they're allowed to and not allowed to do. It's also worth noting that industrial fishers come with much deeper pockets. And so yep. um, there are sometimes these rules and regulations where you're like, that should not be something that is like that should be permitted are permissible for these big boats, but it is. Um, mm -hmm. There was, uh, there's a lot of comment on the fact that while these laws exist and there are some good laws in place, according to the fishers, they're not enforced at all. And so you have a, a group of people saying, we have good laws, we need more enforcement. We have another group of people saying, we need new laws entirely because this is not working. Mm -hmm. um, so there was definitely kind of a, a split with that. Um, what was interesting is with the sort of rules and regulations around, um, like marine protected areas and no take zones in one of my, my favorite, definitely rooted in behavioral science ways to ask a question is not, would you support a marine protected area? Um, because that can lead you to a yes or no, very black and white response. But under mm -hmm. what circumstances would you support a marine protected area? Always elicits a much more interesting response. And right. so um, we did that. We said, under what circumstances would you support a marine protected area? Defining first, right? Make sure, have, everyone has to be on the same page. Under what circumstances yep. would you support a no-take zone? Under what circumstances would you support a turtle excluder device or LED lights? Um, and those were always, so we got, you know, the, the data, um, but we also got some interesting, interesting stories. Well, we'd support a marine protected area only if we were allowed to fish in it and nobody else from the neighboring towns, because this is our area and we know how to be responsible for this. So we would be guardians of our area, but if we were allowed access to it, if we're not allowed access to it either, or a no take zone is created without our knowledge, no, we will not respect that. Right. And so mm -hmm. that was certainly a way to get much more in, in depth information about the support. Um, and one of the biggest questions, which was our final question on what was kind of a long survey, was um, to what extent would you be interested in advising a group of scientists and government officials about the priorities of fishermen? And we were not sure what we would get, but of the small subset of data that, that we've analyzed at this point, we had almost 90% say very interested. And we didn't, we didn't know, right? Because when you throw in both uh, scientists and government officials into the same mm -hmm. sentence, 
the government officials may throw people off and say, no, absolutely not. But we had so many people who were like, yes, we want our voice to be heard. And so even though there is definitely incredible tension between artisanal fishing communities in Ecuador and the national government, the fishers have not given up. They want to still be heard and they want to help out, particularly if it's scientists, particularly if right. it's NGOs. And so definitely different perspectives on the rules and regulations on the different technologies that are available um but overall an overwhelming willingness to co-create and to um share the perspectives of the fishermen which was really cool right that's awesome yeah really really positive i mean you know we hear so much stuff about like the difficulties of, of conserving but you know, I think your project really goes to show that, you know, just taking the time and, and going the extra mile um, and, you know, really being like careful and cautious about the way you approach things can can just open yep. up so much more room, room to work. Um, so what do you think was the hardest part of this project for you in general? Um, anyone who's done research will likely agree. Funding. <laughs> so from, yeah. from an actual project like completion funding mm -hmm. we yeah. still have two provinces to finish right um, we have this we did the majority of the surveying in um, march and april of 2022 we have fishermen coming up to some of our um, students who are still in the area saying where is the where is the report and that's mm -hmm. the most frustrating part about all of this is yeah you know a lot of us are working full time slash multiple jobs to get things done, and and this research, although super critical, needs a little extra funding to keep going. So that is problem number one with this research. Mm -hmm. I would say, um, like I said, we really didn't have a lot of issues um, finding fishermen to speak with, and I don't have enough high praises for my team. That's all them. The number of times. Um, and I'll shout out specifically Luis and Cesco, the, the number of times that they would go up to a group of, of fishers out of, you know, with, with, hello, my name is Luis and I want to, you know, um, do you have an, a moment to chat? It, they just did such a good job. So finding people to chat with um, was not an issue. I think the one of the harder parts of this project, honestly, is listening to the stories that are told. Um, mm -hmm. It was um, an incredibly emotional experience to hear these stories and to uh, sort of partake in the tears of these fishers who want nothing more than to provide for their families, you know, and, and that was really, really hard to listen to. Um, right. And sort of the urgency of all of this, right? And, and that's where the stupid funding comes back into play, but the urgency of, of getting this done so that the government knows that they don't have an excuse to say, well, we actually don't know what the fishers think. Like, no, you do here. We're providing it to you. Right. Like yep. the Leatherback Project and I are a conduit for the voices of the fishers only because we have those relationships in the government and we put together a pretty uh, report. But other than that, we're just presenting what the fishers want to present and have so far been unable to work with the government because there is that chasm between artisanal fishing communities and the government right now. So I would say that urgency is also very, very challenging. Right. And I mean, yeah, they want to see it coming back to them. Yeah. Right. And of course, yeah, you're like, okay, like, you know, we spent this time to like answer your questions and we'd love to see like what's, what's becoming out of it. Um, yeah. So of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really frustrating. Well, I've, gonna send some positive vibes to the to the grand gods um to try to help you guys find some more money to finish that up but yeah um i mean we'll link as well um to the project and stuff in the show notes if anybody's feeling inspired listening to this if they can you know help out in any way to the other yeah, project me. yeah oh yeah exactly mm -hmm. so that that will definitely be linked um in the show notes so people can check it out um i feel like we've already talked a lot about like what was awesome in the project and all the cool things, but what would you say like really stands out for something you loved about doing this project? Besides working with the fishermen, which was like far and away the highlight, another really cool side thing that came from this project was um, working with and networking with um, other cool communities in the area. So mm -hmm. for example, we, um, the Leatherback Project has a whole group of awesome student volunteers, and 
we were able to have a day where we could have a lot of those student volunteers come meet us. And the American Bird Conservancy, the Ecuador chapter also came okay. and they brought these amazing paper mache birds and turtles to where we were having this little event. And it was just a really cool. They also showed their technology for protecting birds. And um, so that was like a really cool side thing, right? Is, is all of this too, is we're listening, but we're also trying to build this like network of communities, connecting people in different provinces who are doing very similar things, um, which was just super cool. And we were able to meet with um, a, uh, rehab center in a province in Ecuador um, who they're doing really good work rehabbing a lot of sea turtles that have come in from boat strikes or who uh, fishers have brought in because the turtles were stuck in the nets for who knows how long. Um, right. And uh, so I think a combination of, of course, talking with the fishers, hearing their stories, being able to photograph them was a huge privilege for me. Um, but then mm -hmm. also just the cool things that came out of, of doing this work because people were super interested in it and wanted to collaborate. And I helped rehab an albatross in the ocean one day. We were swimming in a circle around it so it wouldn't fly away. And like all these cool things happened because people were interested in this project and wanted to support it. So I think that that was um, a huge benefit as well. And one other thing that I loved was um, in addition to taking the photographs of the fishers, we did a really cool thing called participatory photography, um, mm -hmm. or in this case, it was a lot of videography too, where we lent fishers um, cameras for the day, underwater cameras or waterproof cameras rather, and they could take those cameras on their boats mm -hmm. for a sort of a day in the life, right? Because when I'm taking photos, I'm taking photos of things that I think are important. So, so much research or bias there. We want right. to know what's important for the, the fishers in the day in their life. And we got such cool photos um, from this one group. Interestingly, they also had a turtle caught in their net, which they filmed and gave us that data. And that was really good to know too, right? They didn't try and hide from us that they had a turtle. They released her, but uh, we also mm -hmm. saw a pelican get stuck in the same net, right? So it was just a fascinating um, now we have this other data that shows a day in the life of a fishing community. We weren't able to do it often because of the pirates in the area. They're targeted. So we didn't want them to be at any risk having an expensive camera on board. Um, mm -hmm. But that was another thing that I loved looking at the the photos that they took at the end and listening to the videos and their conversations on the high sea. And it was just awesome. So that was also Yeah, really that's cool. so cool. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I definitely, um, yeah, I know it's, it's time and money, but I think it's going to be really cool to see, um, what you're able to, to come out with when, when you can analyze more of the data and, and get maybe some of these videos and photos and stuff mm -hmm. together, um, mm -hmm. for people to see that's, it's, it's going to be really incredible. That's, that's great. Um, so this is hard because I know like there's still so much work to do, but what do you think some of the solutions are, um, in terms of some of these conflicts? Uh, we kind of like touched on some of the, the conservation tools, but mm -hmm. on like a broader picture. You know, I think one of the unanticipated areas of focus that needs an urgent solution is the piracy because right, right. now we want to help fishers in general, but they are completely being targeted and, and injured and killed when they go out to fish. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think one of the, like talking about that, you know, the justice and the protection, one of the most critical things is for the government to increase their, their um, patrolling because the fishers don't feel safe on the, on the right. sea. Um, mm -hmm. And that's terrifying for them. You know, there are people who have been fishing for generations who have given up because they can't, they can't deal with the, the lack of safety. And so when we're talking about all of this, right, within the context of fishing in general, that's like priority almost number one for their safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once they feel safe um, and once the report is done, there needs to be a, a concerted effort for any kind of policy that can impact artisanal fishers to have representatives from all five provinces. Because while we saw a lot of similarities between the five, and again, we really only interviewed three, between the three of the five provinces that we interviewed, there's also a mm -hmm. lot of differences, right? Geographical right. differences, which means different fish will be in the area, cultural differences, um, 
financial socioeconomic differences, right? And so it needs to be a representative group. And what's cool is that there's a lot of cooperatives already existing in Ecuador for fishers. And if those Mm -hmm. cooperatives can make a bigger cooperative, right? Then you have a lot of people who are um, willing to engage with the government, with scientists to make changes. And so there needs to be a concerted effort on the part of the government um, to actively involve artisanal fishers at every step of the process, not, hey, we created this, what do you guys think? It's, hey, we're thinking about creating this based on this data from these scientists about this need for conservation. What are your perspectives? You know, it, it, it needs to change in the point of this report. And in the end of the report, we have what are your what what are what are the next steps for this? Um, that very much needs to be highlighted. And then from the scientist perspective or from, um, you know, scientific focus, so much cool research. They have no idea. I read papers and I've been reading scientific literature for years. Sometimes I'm like, this is very, very hard to understand. And Mm -hmm. we need it to make it understandable for any fisher who's like, hey, I feel like this species of fish is no longer in the area. And I think it was, you know, so it's making this data more accessible and understandable. So there's there's a few different angles to go through. Um, Mm -hmm. Safety, government actually involving the fishers uh, and making a public commitment to do so and then being... um, uh, sort of monitor to make sure that it happens. Right. Yeah. Um, and then also for the science to be made more accessible. Right. That's amazing. That's a super complete, beautiful answer. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, I, I feel like optimistic, um, kind of a positive note then, like, what do you, what do you feel good about, um, for like the future of ocean conservation, um, in, in Ecuador, um, just to kind of leave us on a bit of a, a happier mm-hmm. note. Ecuador is, for being such a tiny country, it has the ability to have an outsized effect on ocean conservation. And not just the conservation of the ocean, but working with communities to ensure that the conservation is a success story and it's durable and it lasts, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that a lot of the elements for that to happen are already there. I, I, I am, I've become a cynic over the years, but despite <laughs> that, I still think that yeah. this is possible. And I think that if Ecuador can do it and if Ecuador can show, and I'm not even talking about the Galapagos right now, it's, it's kind of a different story. Um, yeah. for the coastal fishers, um, you know, I think that they can have a success story and I think then they can be leaders within their communities and within Latin America in general and Central America um, to show that community protected areas and communities being involved in legislation and all of the other things that lead to success um, is possible and it's awesome. And so I think what I got and the fact, even though it's, it is not, it's not a good feeling where, where fishermen are like, where's the data, right? But the fact that people mm-hmm. are still asking yep. is sign to me that they are still, they they haven't given up the fight. So as long as the fishers haven't given up the fight, I'm not going to give up the fight either. Right. Yeah. So there's there's so much uh, room to do good there. Yeah. 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 Lots mm-hmm. of positive and... And yeah, I mean, a little bit of a push and to get the work done. And and I mean, we know if, you know, anybody that's lived in Latin America knows that government can be extremely difficult, like even, I would say worse than <laughs> through a lot of North America. But, mm-hmm. you know, the, the push um, from the people does make a difference and, and can yeah. be can be something great. So, and we just saw that in Ecuador, right? With the protection of the Yasuni mm-hmm. and yep. the whole man on the Choco. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, Ecuador. yeah, as a tiny little side anecdote for anybody that doesn't know, um, there was a, recently a referendum, um, to stop, uh, the majority of like the oil extraction out of, uh, one of the major parks in the Amazon and also to halt mining in the Choco, which is considered one of the most diverse hotspots in the world, actually more so than the Amazon, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, and so the people, I mean, the people said, yes um to protecting so you know like i feel like there's a lot of you know pride here for nature and people do want to do right by it and and so it's just about like we talked about you know finding that 
way to include local people and make sure that they're okay as well and that they have a way of life because we can't take that away just to protect nature either so you know projects like this are are making headway um and we're doing better and i think we'll get there yeah agreed great amazing well, thank you so much, Maria. This is such a cool project. Um, you know, we'll be patiently waiting to see <laughs> as, it, as it evolves and people can uh, go ahead. And we already said that we were going to link the Leatherback project, um, but where else can people find you in general if they're interested in what you're up to? Yes, people can find me on Instagram at Go Green for the Ocean. although I will say that name might change soon. Okay. Well, that's but, fine. We'll link you there. And then yeah. if it changes, you'll let me know and we'll change yeah. it in the show notes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can find me there on LinkedIn if that's your thing. Otherwise, right. I've limited my social media to Instagram. You can find me nice. there. Nice. That's a, that's a solid choice. I understand the, the want to try to, <laughs> to funnel that a little bit. It gets a little yeah. overwhelming. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining me for this episode um, and thank everybody you. that tuned in and listened the whole way through. We appreciate you. Make sure you're following us on all of our social media. If you uh, love what we're doing, you can check out Patreon too, and we will see you next time. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Hey, thanks for sticking around to the end of the episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you head to the show notes, check out the links of things I might have mentioned in the show, go follow us on social media, and yes, do at me. I'd love to hear from you, what you think, if you want to be a guest with me, if you have suggestions for future episodes, that would be great. Other than that, we do have a Patreon link as well below if you're feeling like helping support the show, and I can't wait to see you around for next episode. Thanks. Bye.